Hi there, Luca. Hello, Anar. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you, can hear well. Great to have Hi you. Hi there, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna start with the uh, short introduction, and then we're gonna go straight ahead with the uh, with the questions. Uh, we're recording the uh, the event. If that's okay with okay. you. Sure. Uh, and then we're gonna post it online. Um, what format would you like to follow? Um, well, I mean, uh, I think it just it's question. Straight into Q and A. I haven't been on your forum yes. before. No. Yes. So. Uh, yeah. Just straight into into Q and A. If that's okay with you. Yeah. Okay. So if um, Madan, you're ready, I think we can start. Okay. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today uh, we have the great pleasure to host uh, uh, Manoj Pradhan. Uh, he's an alumnus of the London Business School and founder of the Talking Heads Macro. Uh, his latest book uh, titled The Great Demographic Reversal, Aging Societies, Waning Inequality and Inflation Revival um, is a book that could be described as a panoramic overview of what is uh, to come and uh, how demography uh, will play a central role in uh, um, our future. Um, Thank you very much for having me here, guys. It's a real pleasure. It's a pleasure for us. Thank you. Normally, we start with a, a general question for, for those who haven't uh, read the book yet. It's, uh, we usually start by asking the author um, if he could sum the book into three main points, which is uh, my question. I'd be happy to. Um, so the, the, the three main points of the book uh, are it's very clear that a demographic reversal is upon us. We're at that turning point now, different countries are going through different points. But I think the, the first argument to keep in mind is that the past effects of demography are generally well understood. Most people tend to agree that um, the, the introduction of China, the baby boomers all led to disinflationary impulses. The, decline in inflation, decline in real wage growth in, in, in the last 30 or 35 years is attributed very easily to these forces. So I think the connection that they make with uh, falling inflation, falling wage growth and improving demography is very clear. However, when it comes to a demographic reversal, the same people who agree with the past trend being influenced by demography now argue that even if demography turns, those trends are not going to, to move. So really in a scientific world, the burden of responsibility would be upon them to show why a past relationship breaks. But it's, it's, it's a different time. Um, just to keep in mind, there is that disconnect between past relationships and what people as, uh, perceive as the future relationship. The second point is that Aging is actually inflationary for a few different reasons. And the most intuitive is, let's say there's only the three of us left on this planet, right? Um, and we, we want to try and figure out who's working and who's consuming. All of us consume. And the act of consumption creates demand for a given set of goods and services. Now, let's say in the beginning, um, uh, you, you two are working. I'm the only guy not working, right? So what happens is I, I only consume. But the two of you have an option or the ability to produce more goods, to put more goods on the table. And the more goods you produce and put on the table, the more you offset this inflationary impulse that the three of us make, right? But if you turn the tables, that means I'm the only guy working and the two of you are not working, it becomes much more difficult for me to remove that inflationary impulse. And that's where the world is going. The world is going towards a situation where the number of elderly who are not going to produce now or in the future are going to create an extra inflationary impulse because they only produce and they're gonna reduce the labor force. So the number of people who can create this inflationary impulse are becoming smaller. And if you think about it, uh, you know, workers are deflationary for two reasons. Number one, we all have jobs um, and it makes sense to hire us if the value of our marginal product is less than what we get paid. So except for the CEO uh, in some companies, typically speaking, most workers get paid less than the value of their marginal product. And, and uh, for those of us who are not you know, lucky or unlucky enough to have massive uh, bequests, 
that we can live off, we need to save for the future. So what you get in your hand is already less than what you produce. And what you spend out of what you get in your hand is less than what you receive as income. So workers tend to be deflationary. And as we shift the balance from those who are working to those who are not working, this inflation story moves a little bit. And the third thing I'll, I'll add is looking at our recent experience, what we believe has happened is that inflation story has been accelerated in two ways at least, right? Number one is across most of the advanced economies, including where you are, there is a very serious discussion of the shortage of labor. So uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting that the shortage of labor has created significant wage growth. The, the Federal Reserve uh, and all the other central banks are worried about these wage growth numbers feeding into inflation. And yet when it comes to demography, which is saying exactly the same thing, that output will be lower, wages will be higher, and we'll have inflation risk. People are not willing to take on that extra step in thinking, well, look, what's happening in the short term could be a reflection of what's happening in the long term. Now, I understand that um, you know, in the long term, people are saying, well, firms will react and they'll take on CapEx. But what you're seeing today is even if you take on CapEx, how much of those wage pressures can you reduce? If the participation rate never really comes back, then what we're seeing today might be an advanced screening of a movie that's going to show in the theater next to you in about 10 or 15 years. And I think that's something we really must take a lot of time to make the parallels and, and differences and similarities between. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is well explained in your book, um, but could you please explain why for example, uh, you know, India or, you know, the African countries, uh, they will not be a new, a new China. You know, they, they both have populations which are comparable to China. They both have a, a very uh, young population and a growing population. Uh, why will this not kind of uh, offset the inflationary pressures of uh, an aging China? Uh, it's a good question and one that we actually wrestle a lot with. Um, it's not an easy answer, but here's the, here's the conclusion we came to. The first is that China was not only unique in a sense I'm about to explain, but it was also very lucky. It was very lucky in the sense that China's change um, uh, internally and in its demography happened at a time when the world was very heavily into globalization, right? It, it occurred at a time when uh, cost saving was important. Uh, along came China um, and provided this absolutely incredible uh, workforce um, and a location like the Pearl River Delta, which gave you an opportunity to offshore there, take advantage of relatively low cost of capital, very, very low cost and uh, a relatively well-skilled workforce and at the ability to tap into a market. So that is the combination that really brought China to the forefront. For India, the story is different. Uh, it's not that we are negative on growth on India. We think India and Africa will both do incredibly well. The issue is the world has retreated from globalization. So for, for companies to go headlong into India and Africa, first of all, looks a little bit difficult. But two, what these countries lack relative to China is the kind of organization that China has. For example, if you go back, go back about 150 years, from 150 years till about 2000 years ago, there were only two countries in the world that really meant anything. It was China and it was India. But over the last 40 years, China's per capita GDP has gone so far beyond India's. Um, and the reason for that is that China's centralized structure has been able to push forward uh, reforms at a speed that is not available in India, where the state and the center have a lot of friction. Number two, uh, it has not got the same level of workmanship passed through guilds and through training. Different parts of India are specialized in different things, but the ability to transfer capital from one part to the other is, is not as aggressive. And number three, what has happened over the decades is that there isn't enough administrative capital. So the ability to bring in capital remains. I don't think it's possible for, for India or Africa uh, anywhere at all to export labor to the advanced economies. The political um, ramifications for, the, uh, for uh, advanced countries are just too much. You're seeing what happens even when there's a little immigration. The, the role that goes on is crazy. Um, I believe some of that will change, but not enough, which means the only way you can use India and Africa 
uh, to offset global demography is if you allow capital to come into these countries. But the ability to transform that capital into a gigantic machine of production, that's where I think we're seeing only pockets. For example, in India's uh, automobile sector, it's happening in a big way. If you look at Africa, Africa in, in mining or in telecommunications, it's happening in a big way, but they are not able to transform themselves into a China because of their lack of administrative capital. And frankly, when China came into the picture, um, the demography in the rest of the world was still fine. There was no problem, uh, which means growth in the rest of the world was okay. And you didn't need so much offsetting. By the time India and Africa become really major powers, and they might, you might need three Chinas. Right, just to offset the amount of production you will need and the amount of uh, decline in labor costs you will need will be so gigantic um, that I think the challenges will be bigger. It's possible we are wrong. Uh, it's possible that there can be a dramatic improvement in, um, in, in productivity, because keep in mind, these days, you don't need to have massive capital structures. You don't need to have 20,000 banking units. You need to send a mobile phone to someone but we are yet to see that transformation. If that transformation comes, we'll change our mind. The same way, if you get a drug that cures dementia, our thesis becomes much weaker. If that shows up, I think we'll be the first to acknowledge that, look, something has changed and we should disregard our, our conclusions. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, something, moving on to something uh, more uh, uh, recent. Um, you know, since you publish your books, it seems like your predictions are coming through uh, almost uh, exactly. You know, we're seeing a very strong uh, inflation and very strong infla uh, wage growth, um, at least in the, in the developed world. Um, I mean, uh, we, we all know that this is mostly to, due to uh, supply uh, disruptions, but uh, how much do you think the market pl plays into this? So do you think this um, the baseline inflation is now never gonna come back to uh, the levels that we saw before 2019. Uh, same thing with, uh, with the interest rates. Actually, if you don't mind, especially since this is being recorded, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share one or two slides with you. Oh, please, please. Um, and, and that will kind of help explain where we see the inflation story going. Mm -hmm. So um, if I may share the screen, mm -hmm. I might need host privileges. Uh -huh. Uh, it should work now. Yeah, it's working. I'm just going to share this for a few seconds. So, so this is the way we see the inflation cycle playing out right now. There are actually three drivers of inflation. And the one that markets are focused on, the one that central banks are focused on predominantly is the red line, which is the COVID supply shortages, simply because they cannot keep up with demand. Now, that was what we thought would happen. Um, when um, we, we predicted that inflation would be somewhere between 5 to 10% um, um, in, 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 uh, after the vaccines showed up. However, I think what's changed is most people don't agree that demography leads to inflation, um, but I'll talk about that for a second. But I think the critical flaw for the cycle point of view is that most people are disregarding the green line. And that green line is a story of the Phillips curve, which if you look at Federal Reserve um, and ECB reviews of monetary policy in 2019, one of the key conclusions that came out of there was that they don't want to look at inflation forecast because they believe the ability of their models to forecast inflation has gone down. Initially, when they came out with average inflation targeting, the Federal Reserve wanted to see actual inflation before, before acting. Of course, that debate has become moot now. But, but the whole point being that they don't foresee the kind of inflation that we think is going to be sustained and regular. So let me talk to you about the three drivers of inflation to tell you why we think the story is not yet being understood very well by central banks and markets and why market pricing is not yet reflecting what we think should be the right way to think about it. So I think the COVID inflation demand story is, is very well understood. We all stayed at home. We're all still at home. Um, we got an income shock because we were not consuming services. And because of that, I, one of the reasons I haven't turned my filter on at the back is because of the amount of rubbish I've bought over the last year is embarrassing. I mean, you know, I've got Theory Andre t-shirts, I've got a drum kit, I've got a gaming chair for my son. It's, it's, it's disgraceful. Like well, my wife won't let me bring that into the house. 
but uh, the, the the bottom line being that story is already beginning to ease right that that story is already beginning to change auto sales have gone up in the us housing um, production is going up uh, korea and taiwan are shipping more cars so it's beginning to change however the problem is this is that most central banks and markets think the phillips curve is dead we don't think so our argument is, is that when a Phillips curve is estimated, and, and I hope some of your uh, um, um, uh, viewers are also econometrically minded, uh, I think what happens is you have three things that you consider. You consider inflation, you consider growth, and you consider interest rates, right? And you look at the trade-off between them. The problem is that almost no model of the Phillips curve when it is being estimated asks the simple question, where is inflation coming from? So what they see is over the last 30 or 35 years, inflation has continued to go down. If unemployment is high, inflation is low. If unemployment is low, inflation is low. So they think the relationship between unemployment and inflation and output gap and inflation has broken down. But according to us, a lot of that happened because of China, right? If you're not a manufacturing economy and China's wage level is here, the advanced economy wage level is here, the production sector basically has an implicit threat that it makes to its workers. If you raise wages, I'll offshore to China. That's the threat. So what happens is if China sets the global equilibrium wage, the pressure on all other wages is to come down to it. Because if your wage is above that, production is moving to China for whatever it can. And there's plenty of evidence that this has happened. In other words, what I'm trying to say is there are two Phillips curves. There is a US Phillips curve and there is a global Phillips curve. And China broke the Phillips curve model by being so heavily disinflationary, right? Now, at this point in time, China's model of growth is changing, right? I don't think it has as much ability to perform consumption-led growth as the, the policymakers believe. I think China's state-owned sector still has a huge, huge role. They still get a massive amount of credit allocation, but they're not going on a debt binge. They're not going on a capex binge. So all those disinflationary stories are not really coming out of China right now. And if that's the case, then the Phillips curve that had been pushed down by Chinese disinflation is no longer the same one that we've had for the last 30 or 35 years. So from that point of view, when the output gap rises, when labor shortages become uh, you know, well significant, at that point in time, companies will need to pass on prices. Let me, let me point out another story that I think is poorly understood. Uh, uh, there's a lot of capital that people expect to be deployed in the advanced economies, but there are two kinds of capex, right? One is capex because we're saying, okay, wage growth is 5%, but at the lowest end, the baristas and people with uh, relatively low income and low skills, these are the guys whose wages are growing at 7%. And you know what, if I have a machine, I can replace that level of worker much faster. So that's the kind of capex that is trying to enhance productivity. However, there is also another kind of capex that is saying, you know, it's a little dangerous to invest in China right now. It, the policies are not quite right in India for the supply chain. I'm not sure about investing in Russia or Eastern Europe. And so instead they're pr producing within Europe or within the United States. Now you have gotta be careful about this, why? Because from a US statistics point of view, it will show you that capex is high Output per hour is higher, and therefore we expect inflation to fall. But think what happens if you're Apple. If you're Apple and you wanted to build a new factory in, in, in China, but you say, well, actually, I can't, and I'm going to do it in Tennessee. The cost of producing in Tennessee from Apple's point of view is higher than it would have been somewhere else. So this is the second best option from Apple's point of view. And it's going to say that if I'm producing at my second best option for costs, then I have to pass some of those prices through. So it's not true that all increases in output are going to be uh, inflation um, friendly. Some of them might be detrimental for inflation. We just don't know which kind of capex is happening for what reason. So I would think that there is a, a fair impulse that is changing right now and that is not being understood. And the last point I'll make is, look, let's say we're wrong about demography, right? Let's say it's not really inflationary. At the very least, what we can say is if there are not enough workers in the world, the disinflation won't be as strong. Let's leave the inflation aside, right? Let's say that just because we can't add as many workers, we can't keep pulling wages lower and lower. I mean, we are seeing that today, right? All that means is while inflation was falling in the last 30 or 35 years, 
it because of uh, uh, labor, it kept pulling wages down. So imagine that you're going downhill. If I try to draw a straight line, that is actually above my equilibrium. So the equilibrium is always falling. If the equilibrium has even flattened right now, it's a huge, huge, huge structural change. It's telling you that we need not keep falling to keep up with the structural dynamics. We can stay flat. We can stay at a higher level of inflation and that could be an equilibrium. And I think those two things put together are pretty powerful. Markets are not pricing that in right now. Most of the time, markets seem to believe that um, you know, one and a half percent or two percent of hikes by the Federal Reserve, by the Bank of England, by the Bank of Canada. After two years, they don't need to do anything more. I think this is profoundly mistaken, and a lot of that will change. It doesn't need to change now. It will change a little bit later on, but it will change. Um, uh, I have a short question. It's because uh, I'm not an economist, first of all. So oh, that's like, good. It's a good thing. I was wondering, what do you think central banks should be doing right now? Like, if if we take these predictions as a given, I mean, it, your, your book does cover it a little bit, but like, I was just wondering like what you'd say. Well, first of all, I, I'm, 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 we're in a very different place than we were this time last year. This time last year, I think the debate was kind of, you know, not really, not really finely poised, right? It, it was not even close. I think central banks didn't give a hoot most of the, most of the time, except in emerging markets. And emerging markets is different. Emerging markets, central banks are forced to hike because no one trusts them, right? We don't trust you to do the same thing. So the minute I see inflation, I need you to tighten policy because I don't think um, uh, I have any faith in your policies. But in the advanced economies, uh, if you remember, it was not until... Um, Biden was reconfirmed that the word transitory was dropped from official Fed language, right? It was not until uh, Bostic came out and said, every time you use the word transitory, we should put money in a swear jar. And it was not before September that even the hawks in the FOMC were belligerent because what they saw in September is it, it wasn't just used cars. It wasn't just uh, energy, it was seeping out into broader means. So the Dallas Fed's trimmed mean CPI started rising. And so we've seen uh, uh, emerging market central banks being forced to capitulate very early. You know, Mexico, Brazil, Russia, all these guys had to hike in, in April and May and June. But it wasn't until September that markets got serious about telling advanced economy central banks to start hiking. So the RBNZ is an exception. They got there because the government said these house prices are intolerable. We can talk about housing as well because it's an important part of the story. But where we are right now, the message has gotten through. There are hikes. In fact, now I think we may be overshooting. People are thinking that uh, you know the, the Federal Reserve uh, needs to hike seven times this year. It may be. It's very it's very difficult to calibrate. This expansion is like nothing else we've had before. But that penny has dropped. I think the part that needs to be acknowledged a little bit more is just like the story was, well, it's transitory, well, it's higher than we thought, well, it's gonna last longer than we thought. I think the question that needs to come up is if inflation three years, four years from now is still in the 3% range, what are we going to do about it? I think that's the kind of story that th th there simply is no discussion of. And I think that's a very bad thing because you're setting the market up for another surprise. Um, that, that's never a good thing. Yes, um, and I would like to move on to debt because, uh, uh, as you mentioned in the book, I mean, uh, an aging population is necessarily uh, less productive than uh, than a younger population, uh, uh, at least uh, to the survivors. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know if you know it, but uh, Barry Eigenkreen's recent book in defense of public debt um, uh, says in the chapter that uh, uh, in the past half century any debt uh, reduction has, has been achieved only through growth. So there's never been uh, a substantial decrease in, uh, in expenditure that would uh, offset the increase in debt. Um, connecting to, to, to the theories in your book, do you think that basically debts from now on will only increase because you know, if we have uh, high interest rates, uh, low growth, there is, I mean, what else is gonna eat out the debt I mean, except for inflation? Well, I think you're being very generous when you use the word increase. I think they're going to explode from here. It's, okay. it's very difficult. It's very yeah. difficult to see how you can take care of an aging population um, while the workforce slows down and you don't have immigration. 
ideally what you would have done is you would have said the highly educated workforce, whether it's imported or local, will find capital a complement. Um, the relatively less educated workforce will find capital a substitute. And those who are replaced by capital will then move into the services sector to help look after the elderly. Because one of the points we also make in the book is that we don't think mechanization is anywhere close to being in a position where it can look after the elderly, right? If that changes again, it might be a game changer, but it hasn't happen, happened yet. So the, the, way, the way you can restore productivity, the way you can achieve very high growth are both difficult to do. And I'll tell you why, because look, uh, output growth in the long run and potential, uh, uh, the way to think about potential is it's simply equal to the growth of the labor force plus productivity growth. So the growth of the labor force we know is slowing down pretty significantly in the countries that matter for global GDP, which means productivity growth has to be even higher, right? And for productivity growth to be even higher, we have to understand that the services sector and looking after the elderly is going to become a bigger activity. And that's not a highly productive activity, which means the manufacturing sector productivity has to almost be way higher than we've seen in the past. So th this is something that is a very, very, very difficult proposition. I don't think GDP growth or productivity are going to be enough, as Barry's book suggests. I don't think inflation is going to be enough. There will be inflation. There'll be temptation to do it through inflation. I think the solution that we have is effectively, um, and I'm, I'm, uh, because there are non-economists, um, I'm going to try and be a little bit more um, um, uh, you know, explanatory in, in my concept over here, I think basically what is going to happen is that the central bank is going to turn a government bond, which has a finite life, into a infinitely lived bond whose coupon changes. So they're called consoles. And consoles were issued by, uh, consoles were issued by the Bank of England uh, at a time of war. And they basically never had a retirement value. All we got is a coupon. Now what happens is because there's a maturity value um, or maturity um, period, after 20 years, a massive bond has to, has to retire. So suppose you issue, I don't know, 500 billion worth of bonds and they mature in 10 years. By the time you get to that 10th year, you have to roll it over again. If inflation is already in place, the question is, well, who's gonna buy $500 billion of bonds um, if you don't give them the right interest rate? And if you don't give them the right interest rates and you can't roll out the bond, then you've got a massive crisis on your hands. The only solution out of there is to make the bond infinitely live by getting the central bank to hold more and more of it. So what the Federal Reserve and all these central banks are doing right now in terms of shrinking their balance sheet, this is a very nearsighted, cyclical approach which they want to tell people, look, inflation is different. We want to try and reduce monetary accommodation over longer periods, it's inconceivable to me that the issuer of Federal Reserve or German or Italian debt is going to issue more and more debt. And the biggest buyer with unlimited pockets is going to buy less and less. How do you absorb that? It's not possible. So the, the solution, if you will, is that basically you end up monetizing that debt. That monetized debt does lead to inflation, which itself helps to reduce the real burden um, uh, of debt in the future, but it's the only solution that makes it look sustainable. Otherwise, I don't think the debt is sustainable at all. Um, but okay, this this is a is a global phenomenon. Um, do you think that all developed countries are not well positioned to to deal with this issue, or do you think that there are some uh, exceptional cases where? Uh, uh, the demographic reversal is not going to be as bad. You know, I'm thinking, let's say, comparing, I don't know, uh, France to Italy, which have very different uh, population growth. Well, there's no doubt there's a local story. There's no doubt, right? Uh, I mean, someone, someone like Australia or New Zealand could dramatically change their immigration policies in the future very quickly. In the European Union, uh, that might take a little bit more or less, um, depending on where you get your immigration from. But... It, it's difficult to see where in the advanced economies you're not going to have a population problem out of a lot of them. The United States actually has a pretty reasonable uh, uh, decline in the dependency ratio. It's not too bad. But if I look at Germany, uh, if I look at uh, if I look at uh, Korea, uh, you know these countries, though they're very different when it comes to demography, have very similar serious issues. So yes, I, I think the answer is 
different countries can take different policies, different approaches. But in my experience, what has generally happened is you have seen a crisis first and then a response. It's very rare to see policymakers, because these are not easy choices. If there were easy choices, they would be made now. If opening immigration was an easy choice, it would have been finished now. It's a very difficult one to convince people that we need either more immigration or, or we need to issue more debt or the central bank has to do something that is very dangerous like monetizing the debt. So to reach all those levels, we almost need to reach a point where financing that debt or finding people to look after the elderly becomes such a serious issue that elections are won and lost in it. Once you get to that point, then I think people will come out with solutions. So as, as I forget who has said it, politicians will find the right solutions when all the wrong ones have been exhausted. Yes. I think we need to get to that point before we can see a solution coming in. Yes, um, do you have any question, uh, Madan, that you would like to ask? Uh, oh, we can't hear you. Sorry. I've exhausted my questions, actually. I had a little list, but I mean, most of them are answered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I've got okay. a couple of small comments to make, uh, if, sure. if that's okay with you. Um, the, the, the other things that I wanted to add, number one, uh, I'd mentioned this very briefly, the biggest change to our thesis could come if there is a cure for dementia. That has not yet come about. As of now, the- I was gonna uh, ask you why, because like I, I had heard that. Yes. I mean, effectively speaking, what happens is if the if the elderly, as they grow older, don't really are not at higher risk of dementia, then I think the whole equation changes. For example, right now, um, by the time you move from 65 to 75, your chances of uh, being affected by dementia increase fourfold. When you move from 75 to 85, they increase 16 fold. And if you're above 85, and certainly for those who are above 90, uh, almost 95% of that population have a risk of going into dementia. And I've attended a lot of conferences around that. And the World Alzheimer's Report says that dementia is preventable. The same things that you can do to prevent heart disease and to prevent everything else, active mind, active body, good exercise, good eating, are things that can help reduce dementia. But as of now, we don't have a clear record that this has been achieved. Number two, given that there has been no success in preventing dementia yet, we don't have any success almost in curing it. And so if you can find a solution to it, people can live longer, but also work longer. They don't need elderly care. And that elderly care doesn't have to come either from the government or from your own family. Regardless of what happens, then the debt accumulation that is required to look after the elderly who are going to be afflicted by dementia is significantly lower. And if that happens, then the question of inflation needed to reduce debt then also become smaller. So it really is a silver bullet. And this is one time that we've written a thesis that we would be absolutely thrilled if uh, we're wrong, because it would mean a much better future for everyone else. Yes, that is true. But, but I mean, do you see people uh, working for that long I and mean, working past their 60s and 70s? Because I mean, uh, uh, I don't think many people, I mean, the average person would love to, to work until you know, they can't work anymore, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, I keep telling Charles that he is absolutely the wrong person to write this book. <laughs> I mean, the man in his 80s, he's got incredible amounts of physical energy. He reads more within two days than I can within a week. Um, and, and really, it's, it's, a, it's a testament to what you can do to raise productivity. His mm -hmm. thinking is razor sharp. There are people who will work. I certainly have absolutely no plans to retire. Yes, I'll go and play a little bit more tennis but I have no plans to retire. And I, the, the first bit of advice I give to anyone is do not think of retirement. You need to have an active mind and an active body. And I think that is going to change over time. In Japan, one of the most famous books that was sold over there was called The 100 Year Life. And they were telling you how to successfully navigate life in a fruitful, uh, enjoyable manner, keeping in mind that you're going to be 100. And it's not just about savings. It's not just about how to plan your retirement. Retirement itself is a concept that changes. So yes, I do think those changes are coming um, as our life expectancy increases from here. And I think there's a lot of work going into dementia and Alzheimer's. It's just that you know it's much easier to deal with a, with a part of the body, uh, like a hand or, 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 or even a liver, which is relatively similar. When it comes to the mind, the nuances are so dissimilar that 
success has been relatively elusive so far. Yes, the brain is, is a complex machine, isn't it? That's, it really is. Yeah. Uh, well, I would have a last question, uh, unless Madan wants to ask something else. Uh, it's a bit of a wonkish question. So since you start, you published your book, I noticed uh, that a lot more uh, uh, academic papers have been published uh, that address the demographic uh, uh, um, problem. I mean, I mean, I don't know if there's a casual re relationship behind this, but uh, I, still, I still think it's uh, quite interesting. And specifically, uh, I don't know if you read the uh, paper uh, which is titled, uh, What Explains the Decline in uh, R, Star, uh, Rising Income and Quantity by uh, Antif Mian, uh, Straub, and uh, Sufi. Well, basically- and, uh, At Jackson Hole. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. And uh, um, and basically their main thesis is that uh, uh, the research says that uh, rising inequality is a more important factor in explaining, in explaining their decline in R than is demogra demography, at least uh, you know in the, until 2019. Uh, what do you think about that? Actually, I'm going to share slides again Please. because, Please. to your delight, I had prepared exactly <laughs> that question um, on that paper, and I think it's an excellent paper. First of all, I what I really loved about that paper is they took an abstract concept like inequality, and they quantified it in a way that makes people understand that this can have a real impact on interest rates and therefore on asset prices, on central bank policy, on everything else. So massive congratulations to them. That is something that we did not manage to do. We talked about inequality still as an abstract concept that had uh, political and economic repercussions, but the way they have quantified this is absolutely spectacular. Having said that, I think the, the way they put inequality and demography in contrast with each other leaves a little bit of explanation, I think, that might help. In our world, what they're saying is actually quite complementary, right? So the, the first two graphs that they generate over here are very simple, where they say that, look, in the top 10%, you save a lot more. In the bottom 50%, you save a lot less. Um, that top 10% share has been going up, and that means you're saving a lot more in this economy. And those savings are going into uh, bond markets, and those bond markets have therefore seen declining interest rates. Fine. Um, nothing over here is um, uh, controversial. Now, what happens because of inequality? If they're right about this kind of inequality, then the effect of all inequality should be the same. However, as Milanovic has told us, uh, that was in his excellent book, there's been rising inequality within the advanced economies, but there has been falling inequality globally because countries like India and China, as, as you mentioned in your questions, they have done so much better over the last three decades or four decades that they have caught up a lot more with the advanced economies. So now look at what happens. The R star estimate that they say has been falling actually falls uh, in Laubach and Williams estimate, which is what they use in line with the change in manufacturing employment. So the, the chart on the right, which looks eerily similar has nothing to do with R star. It's actually a chart which shows US manufacturing employment from a paper called The Surprisingly Swift Decline in US Manufacturing Employment by two Federal Reserve researchers, Pierce and Schott. And what they show you with microeconomic good by good evidence is that in the year 2000, which is when that decline begins, Congress gave China permanent normal trade relations uh, status. That's most favored nation uh, yeah. as we commonly know it. And until then, a lot of the products that could have been manufactured in China were actually manufactured in the United States because the threat of tariffs on China said, okay, if, if there are tariffs on China, we can't produce there, it'll be uncompetitive. But once that threat was taken away, a lot of the goods that used to be produced within the United States were then shifted across to China. And that decline is what led to production being offshored into China and therefore required desired investment within the advanced economies came down. So the whole simple point is, uh, if I need to produce, build the next factory, I'm going to build it in the Pearl River Delta, not in Tennessee. But as soon as I don't build a factory in Tennessee, I don't need to borrow money to build that factory in Tennessee. So the demand for money within the United States goes down and R star therefore goes down. So what Laubach and Williams captured was actually something that explains why global inequality fell and why US inequality rose. Now, the tricky part is this. Okay, rising inequality should lead to falling R star. 
according to Mian and Sufi, right? But if global inequality is falling, then shouldn't R star go up? In their model, you can't explain this because they only think US. But if you look at what's happening in their model, it's very consistent with the way we have defined things. So Faith Guvenen, who was their discussant at Jackson Hole, explains that the increase in the share of the top 10%, which I showed you as the chart over here, the right-hand side chart shows you how the share of the top 10% is going up. Faith Guvenen shows you a chart at that same conference, which tells you that the share of the top 10% went up because the share of the bottom 50% went down. Hmm. The bottom 50% suffered a lot more. And if you stick to our version of events, which is that China became a huge competitor for the United States, it explains why the Chinese worker would have taken away market share from America, and that impact would have fallen on the lower 50%. So if you look at demography as the starting point, you can not only explain uh, rising inequality in the United States, but you can also explain falling inequality globally. And that explains why R star was able to come down. So rather than thinking that they are a, um, they, uh, they are providing a alternative thesis, their thesis is actually far more complementary than one can imagine. Uh, what I'll do, Luca, especially since you have a paper, I've written a note for my clients on this when their paper mm -hmm. came out. Um, and I'll send that note across. Please do feel free to share it with uh, uh, with your readers. Please, uh, I would love to. Um, last question. So uh, I didn't get the final point of the explanation, as in um, the great demographic reversal will bring inequality in rich countries down. Was that the, the conclusion? I, I didn't that, get the conclusion. That was the conclusion. The conclusion was what has happened over the last 30 or 35 years is that this burst of labor supply has led to a decline in interest rates. The decline in interest rates has led to accumulation of assets. Um, the shift of production from the United States to China and from the advanced economies to China has led to a greater share of profits in the system and a lower share of labor in that, in that society, right? What happens now is if you're right and all these trends reverse, then the market power of labor rises. I don't think we can argue with that given what we are seeing in, in the economy today. Um, I think interest rates will rise. It's very difficult to argue with that given what we're seeing here today. And asset prices come under pressure. So if you've looked at the equity market in the last month, uh, we know that in order to survive, companies will have to do something different and radical. In fact, if you look at the United States and you take away the top eight companies in the Standard & Poor's 500 index, the rest of the index has actually done very badly. It has not done well at all. So even though the US equity market looks like it's flying, if you take away those eight high performing companies, the, the rest of the equity space has not really done very well. So it's easy to see why corporate bonds come under pressure because they have to pay more money to borrow uh, cash. The companies that do very well are the ones that will be productive. We should be rewarding to, them for that anyway. Interest rates go up, labor gets a larger share of income. Um, and that reverses some of the trends. The, the thing is, it's not happening in a fantastic way because growth is low. What we would have liked to see is high growth and labor getting a larger share. So no one's complaining. Unfortunately, that, that decline in inequality is almost happening under a bit of a shadow of a cloud of low growth. But nevertheless, it is endogenously changing and it's getting better over that period of time. Um, and my last question, if it's okay, would be because uh, I, I put all my savings in the S&P 500. So if not in the S&P 500, where should I put it? <laughs> well, the thing is, you, 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 giving you personal advice is always something that I stayed away from. Um, but the, the investment opportunities, if you look in the equity space, are actually something you have to do your homework on. You, you'll, have to, you, you'll have to see which companies are able to see changing trends where they're able to adapt and who's doing more productive work. I think that's the easiest way to find out. I will tell you though, that the healthcare sector has a lot of opportunities for startups because that's somewhere where it's a very personalized service that has to be given to the elderly, but there are some similarities that are not being exploited right now. Number two, I would look very carefully at emerging markets. Um, and there are some emerging markets that do have a model of growth. Um, and, and I think they, they provide you a better value. For example, let me explain what I mean by that. 
in the past, if you have to make progress, you would need to have a taxi service, right? Uh, today with Uber, you don't. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in order to mobilize capital in the past, you would need a banking sector and you would need tons and tons of banks to be built and people to be staffed. I just sent people a phone uh, in, the, in the mail and suddenly they have access to banking services that they never did in the past. So there are places that, that are so uh, attractive because they're inefficient. It may not sound great, but any place that, has, that is inefficient and has an ability to improve its efficiency uh, is a very promising prospect. For example, I, I started after years and years, I started playing tennis. Um, and initially my progress is going to be quite rapid because I'm making so many mistakes that my coach has a very easy time uh, telling me, well, you're doing 200 things wrong. Let's correct the first 10 that are absolutely horrendous. And if he does that, then my game improves substantially. I think there are a lot of emerging markets who are still in that position that can protect you and protect your returns over a period of time. I just don't think it's going to be that easy. I think it's going to be hard picking, but let's hope we're all wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, um, pleasure. A real pleasure to be here. I enjoyed no. that. Thank you. <laughs> we, all, we also did. Uh, well, we'll hope to have you uh, next book you write, uh, if you write one uh, soon enough. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you to all our listeners. Uh, and see you next time. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay.